right, in this section we're briefly going to talk about protists, and then in the lectures tomorrow and Friday, we're going to be talking about fungi and plants. So last time we talked about bacteria and viruses, and bacteria specifically, they were the first living things we talked about, they were all prokaryotic cells. So they were in the domains archaea and bacteria, and they all consisted of prokaryotic single-celled organisms. Every other kingdom, protista being the first one we're going to be talking about, is going to consist of eukaryotic cells. So they're about uh, uh, 10 times bigger at least, 10 to 100 times bigger. They have a nucleus, they have all the cell machinery, all that sort of stuff. Um, so protists in particular, we find them all around us, and they're a very diverse kingdom. Things kind of get thrown into protista because they don't fit any other kingdom. So they're kind of like animals, but they're single-celled and they're simple. We're going to put them in protista. They're kind of like plants. They make their own food, but they're single-celled and they live in water. We're going to make them protista. You know, they behave somewhat like funguses, but again, they're very simple. We're going to throw them in protista. So eventually protista is probably going to get broken up into multiple kingdoms. Most protists are single-celled, unicellular. Um, some can be multicellular or what's called colonial, where they're like a group of cells living together. And they're kind of subdivided into three main general groups, animal-like, the ones that move and can make their own food, plant-like, the ones that typically don't move and do make their own food, and then fungus-like, the ones that sort of behave like funguses. So, uh, animal-like protists we're going to do first. They are known as protozoans. Protozoans. Zoa, or Z-O-A, refers to animals. So animal-like protists, protozoans, literally translates to first animals. They are heterotrophic, so they have to obtain their food. Um, and typically they are classified by how they move. So they may move by pseudopods, which are false feet. I'm going to show you some pictures of all of these. Um, and we're going to do a lab where you're going to look at them as well. So pseudopods, ciliates move by cilia. So these are kind of globular feet that look like this. Ciliates move by cilia, which are little tiny hairs that kind of surround them. Uh, flagellates will have a single tail, a flagellum. And then there's some that don't move and they're just parasitic. So they live inside of other organisms that can cause diseases. All right, so um, let's look at pseudopods first. So an amoeba is the best example of one that has pseudopods. So it's got a lot of different cell parts. We're going to look at these in the lab. This is the nucleus, so you know it's eukaryotic. It's not a bacteria. It's much bigger than bacteria. Uh, and they basically engulf their food with these false feed or pseudopods. They can literally surround a food particle, stretch these out, surround it, engulf it, and that's how they eat. This is paramecium. This is probably the most common ciliate. So these guys have cilia, which are little tiny hairs. See how there's thousands of these itty bitty hairs, not just one or two big hairs, but these tiny hairs. Um, paramecium actually eat their food. They actually have a mouth. It's called the oral groove. They basically suck in water. They have a nucleus. Um, they have something called contractile vacuoles to squirt out excess water. And they even have an anal pore to get rid of wastes. So they actually um, are typically um, fresh, little freshwater organisms. And you're going to see these in the lab as well. So those are some examples of animal-like protists. Now, plant-like protists, also called algae most of the time, these are autotrophic. They make their own food, just like plants. So that's um, what all algae have in common. Most of them are single-celled. The multicellular ones tend to live in colonies, meaning it's a group of cells, but the cells technically could survive on their own. And there's different kinds of algae, dinoflagellates, flagellates, sorry, um, they're known for having two flagella. I believe they also sometimes are called fire algae, I want to say. I know these are the ones I believe that cause red tide, which is um, something in the ocean. Uh, green algae have chlorophyll-like plants, so they're green, but they're not as complicated as plants and they can't live on land. Red algae, rhodophyta, they have a red pigment. Brown algae, phyophyta, they have a brown pigment. Uh, but all of them can make their own food. Okay, um, euglena is kind of a mix. It has a flagellum, so it actually moves like a protozoan, but interestingly, it has chloroplasts, and it has the ability to make its own food. I believe they can eat as well. They can be heterotrophs if there's no, um, if there's no food available. So they can actually behave kind of like a plant and kind of like an animal. So it's kind of hard to classify whether they're, they're not really an algae, they're not really a protozoan, 
uh, but they are flagellates, meaning they have a flagellum. All right, and that brings us to the last group, fungus-like protists. So fungus-like protists are heterotrophic. They cannot make their own food. They have cell walls. Um, they all have the ability to move at some point in their lives, and they reproduce with something called spores. So examples are kind of weird. Water molds, downy molds, slime molds. I'm going to show you a little quick video of them right now so you can see what they look like. Some organisms that are neither animal-like nor plant-like can be lumped into a group broadly referred to as fungus-like protists. They're somewhat similar to fungi in that they're heterotrophic, living on decomposing organic matter, while also exhibiting characteristics found in protozoans. Acellular slime molds in the phylum Myxomycota are one of the major fungus-like groups. In part of their life cycle, these organisms have an amoeba-like appearance, called a plasmodium, that forms a slow-moving, feeding, slimy mass. When environmental conditions become unfavorable, the slimy mass forms spore-producing structures. Spores are then released when favorable conditions return. Cellular slime molds in the phylum Acrasiomycota live in fresh water, moist soils, or on decaying plant matter. In what's called the feeding stage of their life cycle, they move around as individual amoeboid cells. When food becomes scarce, the cells congregate, forming a mass called a pseudoplasmodium. This structure is capable of producing haploid spores. The haploid spores, under favorable conditions, generate amoeboid cells, starting the feeding stage all over again. A third group of fungus-like protists are in the phylum Oomycota. They include water molds and downy mildews. These protists consist of finely branched single-cell filaments. They differ from true fungi in their cellular composition, life cycle, and in their sexual mode of reproduction. Okay, so that kind of gives you an overview of the fungus-like ones. Let me see if I, I'll, I'll show you a real quick video of the animal-like ones so you can see those too. One way biologists group protists is based on the way they get food. Heterotrophic protists that eat other things for their nutritional needs are broadly grouped as animal-like protists. Animal-like protists, referred to as protozoans, are unicellular or colonial, in which a small group of singular cells live together. You observe. Describe the shape of this protozoan. As you can see, it has no definite shape and is continuously changing. This protozoan is an amoeba, and it's in the phylum Sarcodyna. Sarcodynes are single-celled protozoans commonly found in freshwater and saltwater. Sarcodynes, such as amoebas, have no definite shape and move by means of false feet called pseudopods that are filled with cytoplasm. They also use pseudopods to surround and engulf food particles. Sarcodines most commonly reproduce via cell division. Some kinds of amoebas can cause diseases. Amoebic dysentery is an example and is most commonly contracted from drinking contaminated water. Some sarcodines, such as radiolarians and foraminiferans, are surrounded by protective shells. Radiolarians, for example, have glassy, silica-based skeletons. These organisms are abundant in the oceans. Looking at other types of protists, this interesting-looking protozoan, called a paramecium, is in the phylum Ciliophora. Ciliates, as they're commonly called, 
are surrounded by many hair-like projections called cilia. Cilia help these organisms move through the water and also guide food into the cell. Ciliates are different from other protozoans in that they have two different nuclei within the cell. Ciliates can reproduce asexually via binary fission as well as sexually in a process referred to as conjugation. Zooflagellates in the phylum Zoomastigyna move in another way by beating a whip-like flagella. Many species of zooflagellates live in the bodies of plants or animals, with some being quite harmful. One harmful species is Trypanosoma brucei, which causes the disease African sleeping sickness spread by the bite of the tsetse fly. The last group of protozoans we'll discuss are sporozoans. These are organisms that are non-modal. In other words, they can't move themselves. They're also parasitic, meaning they live off another organism. They often cause disease in animals, including humans. One of the most well-known sporozoans is in the genus Plasmodium. It's a parasite that causes human malaria. Malaria is a disease that's killed millions of people over the centuries. The parasite is transmitted to humans by the bite of the female Anopheles mosquito.